I'm Patrick Norton. Every day's Blinky Day on the Screensavers. And I'm Leo Laporte. Thank you for joining us. Coming up in today's show, it's the triumph of the nerd <laughs> in our geek library. Oh, ain't that charming? And we're going to talk with Network World's Carolyn Marsan, who's here to tell us about the next version of the Internet Protocol that's going to make the web a, a little better place to surf. IPv6. Word. Then later, <laughs> you want to boost the performance of your iMac? You actually can. Yes. We're going to make it as powerful as a G4. So we're going to find out just what you can do to take that iMac and make it something a little more beefy, a little burlier, a little happier. Now, folks, before we introduce today's scintillating topic in the chat room, we need to check in the final results of our last poll. Now, we, we talked about Moodwatch, the email that tells you whether or not you're... Uh, well, propagating flame mail. 20% of you said, yes, it's a good idea. 40% of you say, no, it's a good idea. And the other 40% of you said, Leo? They didn't say Leo. Well, they, they said, said, shut up, you jerk. Yeah, teach me to cue you on air. <laughs> <laughs> that topic is, folks. Well, I thought uh, you said they said Leo. No. Uh, I said Leo. Can the nerds <laughs> declare victory? Say it loud. Say it proud. I'm nerd and proud. So this is in reference to, obviously, our geek library topic, right? Pride yeah, for the Nerds. Yeah, Pride for the Nerds, this 1996 documentary. That was really, you know, before the Internet sort of exploded and we all knew it wasn't the meek shall inherit. I can't even say that. I'm going to get shot if I make it. The nerds shall inherit the Earth. They already did. And you know what? Yeah. We were the guys on the AV squad. We couldn't get the dates. The cheerleaders laughed at us. The, the football players beat us up. But you know what? We got all the money now. <laughs> And I think, seriously, the nerds can declare victory. And I think nerd number one, numero uno, Bill Gates, I mean, talk about They're the nerdiest guy alive, don't you think? He's, he's way up there. He is. And he yeah. also happens to be the richest man in the world. Okay, coinky dink? I think not. Yeah, Michael Jordan doesn't have to, what, play basketball for the next 60 years to get, like, I think half a quarter. That's true. Of it's oh, man. Yeah. The, the, the nerds have won. At least if, if financial gain is your only measure. In, in all seriousness, I don't think this is such a bad thing because I think what's happened in our society in the past where we value brawn or other kinds of talents, what do we value now? We value brain power, the ability to create with your brain, something of value, that is one of the most valued things in our society. Is that a good thing? I think so. I think the only reason they're valuing it, there's nothing, I mean, the people came up with the whole concept of the Internet, IP, computers in general, and awesome. you know what? That was before they realized they were more asocial nerds. What's the matter with being a balanced individual, Leo? I say, huh? rewarding brains is a good thing. Yes, Triumph right. of the nerds has come true. What do you think? Take our web post at screensavers.com. As always, you can give us a call. Telephone at 888-989-7879 or send us a fax. Only while the show is live at 415-437-5869. And chat with us at mm -hmm. chat.techtv.com. Now, if you go to the screensavers room, that's where the main party is. But if you have a net cam, one of those little cameras hooked up to your computer, and you want to ask your question on camera with us, we love that. Go to the net cam Cineplex and say hi to our hosts in there today. Hi. Hello there, Shannon and Roger. Roger. I want to say yes. my glasses are sick and I am proud. Both of you. I was proud. never anti-social, I might add. Were you on the AV squad, Roger? There was no AV squad. I was in orchestra, and that was fine for me. Academic to cast on. I was in drama. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that is the most <laughs> nerdy. Those two are just so nerdy. Oh, my God. Female. Female. <laughs> we love them. If you want to get on the air, that's who you're going to talk to, Shannon and Roger. If you do get on the air uh, with your net cam, we're going to give you this lovely magnetic picture frame as your reward. Today on the cover of Time Magazine, it's Obi-Wan Kenobi and Jimmy. And Jimmy. Jimmy on the cover of Time <laughs> reprising his role as a Jedi. Oh, we're getting master. a shot. we got to get really close so you can see yeah. the fact that there's something desperately wrong with this Time Magazine cover here. So can we get close enough? There's something, there's something wrong with uh, with Obi Wan there, don't you think? There's just something a little twisted there. You can get your picture on the fridge, doesn't it match? <laughs> yeah, that would be one thing. All those Photoshop nutty kids. <laughs> Send it to the screensavers at TechTV.com. Probably got it at the carnival. Make make fridge picture the subject line. Oh man, Chris joins us on the Tech TV Netcam Network from Redding, California. How's it going tonight, Chris? Oh, pretty good. How are you guys doing? We're yeah. great. How are you? Oh, good. Oh, let, uh, let me send you a magnet, okay? Okay. Suck! It's one of my favorite stories. <laughs> what can we do for you, Christopher? Well, I'm having a uh, problem with my computer locking up. Yes. Oh. Hard lock. Yes. Where nothing works. And you don't have the keys. And I do not have the keys. No. Wow. When did uh, it happen? 
Well, it, it, it's any given time. Uh, it could be 10 minutes after I turn it on or a couple hours. Does it happen mostly when you're on the Internet? Yeah. Yep. yep. That's very, very common, by the way. Yeah. And uh, I think I've traced it down to uh, uh, two apps that are running in the background when I push Control off the lead. Uh huh. Uh, message 32 and Message Loop. So why do you think it's? Why do you think it's those? Uh, because when I when I uh, end task on those, mm -hmm. then they uh, give me an unresponsive. Right. Screen. That's not what's causing the crash, but it is a side effect of the crash. Oh, okay. Yeah, those message servers are part of the Windows. Um, I believe they're part of Olay or ActiveX. They're part of the Windows. It's just like saying, um, when I crash, I get a kernel 32 error. It must right. be kernel 32 that's crashing. Actually, okay. it's the memory leak. <clears throat> right. It's something else. Um, I see those errors all the time, along with run DLL errors. Those are the, those are very common, and they do have a they have to do with the subsystem of Windows crashing. And the fact that it happens on the internet tells us a lot about what's going on. IP stack problems. <clears throat> It could be that. It could be. Uh, I, I've noticed even just a corrupted cache sometimes will cause this. You clear the clear the browser cache is number one. Are you using the latest versions of the browser? Yes, I am. Okay. Internet Explorer or Netscape? Internet Explorer and Netscape. Okay. Does it happen more with one or the other? Uh, actually, it happens more with Outlook Express. Outlook Express. Really? Huh. Yeah, it's frustrating when I'm composing a mail. And it's and it just button. cuts out. Have yeah. you tried up? Uh, have you tried reinstalling uh, Outlook Express? No, I haven't. Um, one of the first things you might want to do is, like Leo said, clear out the cache. It's also probably a good time to actually take Outlook Express out and reload it fresh. That can often do a lot, actually, in, in a situation like this where the, where the basically the application is just funking out on you. Um, you had mentioned before you said a couple particular DLLs or, or, or executables you thought were responsible for the problem. No, those are those message servers. But I, yeah, I think that's, that that, I mean, that's yeah, they're 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 basically part of the the messaging system Windows uses. But like Leo's right, I think those are probably crashing as a result of something else. It's really hard yeah. to uh, basically what we're saying is we don't know. It's really hard to diagnose a crash from the error message for a couple of reasons. First of all, error messages are not designed for you and me. They're designed for the guy who wrote the program. So the information that's in there is extremely cryptic and really only useful to somebody who knows that has the source code in front of them. So I get an error message on the crash itself. Right, right. Yeah. If later it, those are hung up. Yeah. I, no, it locks hard. I have to shut it completely down. Right. Oh well, then how do you know when you hit, how, you can't hit Control Alt Delete? No, when I when I first start up the computer, I hit Control Alt Delete to see what's running. And uh, then you get the non-responsive. And if I if I hit End Task on the message 32 or the message loop, yep. then I get the non-responsive dialog. Oh, that's, yeah, that's meaningless. That just means they won't let you close it. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, that, that's not that's not the source of the error. It's really, yeah. really hard to track down uh, errors with or without the error message. Yeah. It's, of course, with not having error message doesn't help. <laughs> but yes, a hard freeze like that, I don't know. What, yeah, it, first of all, if you, if you can't tie it to a particular program, or at this point, is it pretty much only happening if you're up on the Internet? I uh, know I have had it. It happened a couple other times, but I notice it more when I'm on the internet. Yeah, that's okay. when I. I mean, that's when I see those freezes most yeah. often. And it looks to me, in my experience, like when Java loads, that's yeah. a very common time. Um, you say it's happening when your Outlook is. Is Outlook or Outlook Express? Outlook Express. I also have Outlook loaded on the machine, but I don't use it. Right. Yeah. You know. You, I, I would almost say, you know what, the uh, nice thing to do at this point, maybe stop, back up your data. Rebuild. Do, yeah, do a rebuild, yeah. a fresh install. Because um, it sounds like, you know, it could, be, it could be just about anything causing your system to lock up. I would check to make sure there weren't any funky applications you were running intentionally. Um, some of the lesser well-developed shareware programs, some of the newer uh, Microsoft uh, office suites have always been sort of problematic a lot of the times. And uh, taking those around, and uh, if you're absolutely positive it's some particular application that keeps restarting and you don't know what it is, you want to be careful, but you can run MS Config, go into the startup and uncheck uh, if there's a checkbox related or a listing related to that on startup. If you can try to eliminate it that way, you know, definitely heed what Leo said. You know, there's, just because it's in there doesn't mean it's actually related to the crash. I've seen unresponsive, that unresponsive yeah. message server message many, many times. Yeah. And, you know, when I see it, actually, it is related to Outlook. It, uh, sometimes Outlook gets hung up, and that's a way to get Outlook to get out of it. Yeah. But I don't know if that's related to the freezing. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's yeah. Just, basically, we have no answer. Right. We have no answer. <laughs> After the break, it may not be dinner in a movie, but we've got some video, and it comes out of a refrigerator. Hey, it's cool. It's Geek Library Time and the Screen Savers
Welcome back to the Screen Savers. Time once again for the Screen Savers Geek, Geek Library. Library. Yay. Where we recommend for your <laughs> geek pleasure, nicely done, Gladiator. One of our all-time favorite books, movies, software titles, bookmarks, whatever. And Leo oh, ripped the door off of the uh, <laughs> legendary <laughs> Screen Savers. And put these in there. All right. This is our book of the, uh, of the week. Actually, it's really a... Um, it's really a, a video and a book. It's the Triumph of the Nerds. Did you see this when this was on PBS? Yes. 1996 documentary based on the originally on the book uh, Accidental Empires by Robert X. Cringely. Cringely is the gossip columnist for InfoWorld. Therein hangs a tale, by the way. And, and apparently, uh, you know, if you look at these legends between Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, so he must be a legend in the industry. He's too. a legend in his own mind, but he still do a good job with this. This is the uh, the yeah, video caddy. based on it. <laughs> well, it's a long. I don't want to get in a long tawdry story. One of the nice things. And I give, I give Bob a lot of credit, as well as his producer, a lot of credit for getting the biggest names, including somebody we've tried for three years to get on TV who refuses to do any media interviews, Steve Jobs. Yeah. Gates is on here. Jobs is on here. Ellison, all the names in the industry. It is an introduction to computer history yeah. that is so good that we give it to people who come to Tech TV to fill them in on what they missed. Yes. Yeah. It's that good. It's a good year. We're going to show a little bit of it. One of the things they did, which I thought was wonderful, is they got two Apple CEOs to talk about why Microsoft has been so successful. Watch. The industry wasn't measured by who has the best-selling personal computer you know, or who has the most innovative technology. The industry was measured by uh, who had the most open system that was adopted by the most other companies. And the Microsoft strategy ultimately turned out to be the better business strategy. The only problem with Microsoft is they just have no taste. They have absolutely no taste. And, and, and what that means is, I don't mean that in a small way, I mean that in a big way. <laughs> God, tell us what you're really I thinking, Steve. He goes on and on. He basically says Microsoft software is junk. And uh, But you know what? That's one of the things I love yeah. about Steve is he speaks his mind. Well, I wish we could get him on this show. Yeah. Well, we wish we could get Apple to answer our questions, but anyway, three VHS tapes, about $50. If you are especially a young person who wasn't around for all this, I mean, I was, I remember all this, and even for me, it was more than a trip down memory lane. It was very informative. Uh, I highly recommend it. Everybody's on here, from Ed Roberts, the guy who created the personal computer. Many people forget and miss out there. Uh, to uh, Wozniak and Jobs, who created Apple Computer. Larry Ellison. Bill Gates, as I mentioned, is on here, too, saying nice things about Apple, of all things. Imagine that. I guess he kind of regretted that after he saw the TV show. The Triumph <laughs> of the Nerds. You can get it at PBS.org or probably at any uh, anybody uh, who sells uh, videotapes. It's our Geek Library recommendation this week. Highly recommended. To fill out your Geek Library, check out our website for a complete listing. It's all at the screensavers.com. Spencer joins us on the phone from Albuquerque, New Mexico. What's up, Spencer? Um, yeah, I'm trying to, I installed Linux Mandrake 7.1 on my computer. Okay. And now I'm trying to get my modem and my sound card up, but it's not recognizing them. Oh, that's too bad. You know, of all of the Linux distribution, 7.1 is probably yeah. the best at recognizing hardware, which means you probably have hardware that's not supported. Have you checked on the Red Hat? Now, this is the weird thing about Mandrake. You can go to the Mandrake site, which is linux-mandrake.com, but Mandrake is really just kind of a souped-up Red Hat. Uh, have you gone to the Red Hat site and looked at their hardware compatibility list? No, I haven't. Yeah, that's the first thing before you install Linux yeah. you should do. Are these are these uh, card-based modem and and uh, no, they're integrated. What kind of motherboard, motherboard is it? Um, you know, I'm not sure. It's a HP computer. Okay, that probably is your your issue. Probably got a Crystal Sound chip. You think on there? Although yeah. it's supported by Linux. It, it should be. If it's Crystal Sound chip, it should be supported. One of the things you want to do is is. Uh, Either call up HP or pop open the case and figure out exactly what kind of motherboard you have in there, and start searching that. For Leo, is typing madly in the corner, pulling up. Uh, is it OSS driver? OSS is the open sound, yeah. open source sound. Uh, like, I'm just trying to yeah. find the website, and I just can't remember. The thing is, it's odd you. that you get it's uh, your sound's not working. What else isn't working? Your modem? Yeah, but see, it's not even. It's not even detecting it to where I could change drivers or anything. Okay, well, it's not even detecting it, so it's probably not even trying to load drivers for it. At this point... You know, I understand, Link is not yeah. quite the same as, uh, as Windows yeah. 98. It yeah. doesn't do plug and play in exactly. the same way. Do you, you remember Windows 3.1? Or the concept. <laughs> okay, so it, it, instead of basically being like plug and play, where it's searching out and going, oh, it's a sound card. And the sound card and Windows say hello to each other, and then they start doing things. You know, it, Linux is old school. It basically goes, and you're talking about actually individual IRQ addresses and 
it, well, it, 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 it doesn't it you know it doesn't work quite as easy um, and if you don't have driver support for that it's not going to see it's not even going to tell you something's there um, there's a commercial open open source town which you might go to which you maybe can buy right. drivers isn't the right word let me explain how Linux does hardware support what happens is there's the Linux kernel okay which is uh, really very small it's just a small program usually between 400k and a megabyte that interfaces programs to the hardware the kernel has often some support for hardware built in the, key, the critical key stuff like hard drives and things that you have to keyboards things you have mm -hmm. to have but then in order to add software support it does thing it does something called adding uses modules which are then loaded in uh, as the kernel boots those modules, I guess it's anal analogous to a driver in Windows, but it's, it's a very different kind of way of working. And it doesn't go out and, it, you know, in the installation it does it, but doesn't thereafter go out and see, well, what do you got? Right. Oh, let me see if I can load those drivers. One thing you might want to do is find out exactly what chipset is on your motherboard for the modem and for the sound card. You need that information. That's key. You can go to HP's site and get that information. And then you may actually have to go into, get to this point of actually going in and rebuilding the kernel and enabling those modules or finding those modules somewhere on the Internet. Uh, here is one place you can go, which is opensound.com. These guys actually have a good business model. What they said is, well, we understand that a lot of hardware is not supported by Linux, a lot of sound hardware, so we're going to make commercial drivers to support a broader range of sound cards. So sometimes if your sound card isn't supported, oh, let me go back. I just saw the sound cards link here. Uh, it's a good idea to go here. This might, this would tell you some additional sounds that are, the sound cards that are not supported by Red Hat out of the box, but to which you can easily add support for. So the key really is here, and you can see things like the uh, the Emu Wavetable 8000, uh, I mean, there's a lot of oddball stuff in here. Uh, you got to find out what, what First of all, before you can do anything, what HP put in there. This is one of the things we talk about when you're using Linux. Because folks, this isn't Windows. This isn't even Macintosh. This is this is this is something, a, something very kind of <laughs> almost primitive. Yeah. You, it's, you've got to before you install it. You've got to look at the list yeah. of hardware compatibility. And if you don't have hardware compatibility, either a resign yourself to not being able to use that hardware, or b find it before you install it. Yeah. And don't install it if you can't find it. Or you problem. You know, okay. Well, if you, if you can't find it, you don't know what it is. Chances are it's not going to work. Yeah. You know, don't load the wrong driver just to see what happens. So here's the place: OpenSound.com. Take a look, see if you can find that. Go to HP, find out what chip you have. That's the best we can offer. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. Up next, Network World. Carolyn Marson is going to tell us how upgrading our existing internet protocol might just help make the world a better place. When the screensavers roll on, I just figured out here.
SweetSaver.com. That's the best place for more information about what you see on this show. We want you to go to the answers and tips area, whether you're learning how to overclock or thwarting wet pickpockets or a super fast motherboard roundup. The tips and tricks are all there at the screensavers.com. Let's head on over to Patrick and see who he's talking to. Patrick? Oh, uh, Leah, you're going to love this one. Folks, the Internet needs an upgrade. But the question is how is migrating from our existing protocol going to affect the whole world of computing? Carolyn Marsan, the senior editor at Network World, is here to explain the technical and the political issues behind IPv6. Now, welcome to the screensavers, Thanks Carolyn. Thanks for having me on. Now, I understand that, I mean, basically, we, we can play, like, what's a good, like, evil news show. It's like, the Internet is going to crash. Well, it's not, but right. IPv6 is supposed to solve a problem. What is that? Right. The current version of the Internet Protocol is IPv4, uh-huh. and it uses 32-bit address space. Uh-huh. And because of a long history of inefficient assignments of addresses, uh-huh. we're actually running out of address space. It's most uh, severe uh-huh. outside the U.S., um, particularly in Japan and in Europe. Uh-huh. Um, you know, it's a much more severe crisis there than it is here in the United States. So it sounds like you, know, you mentioned that. What's the, the major change that's going to be made to, between IP and, and IPv6? IPv4 uses 32-bit address space, so it uh-huh. can support theoretically about 4 billion computers connected to the okay. Internet. But IPv6 uses 128-bit address space. Okay. So if you do the math on that, it's a virtually unlimited right. amount of computers, you devices. Ton more numbers exactly, to work Exactly. Your refrigerator, your washing machine, etc. It can all be hooked directly to the Internet. I don't know if I'm ready to hook my refrigerator <laughs> to the Internet, but okay, so this is like we've had the problems with memory address space and, and hard drive address space and everything else or encryption where basically we need more numbers to work right, with. Right, exactly. Um, what else is actually going on with IPv6? Is it actually going to implement security changes too? Yes, IPv6 has built into it a lot of features that have been band-aided on to uh-huh. IPv4 over the years, so it has end-to-end security and it uh-huh. supports a lot of advanced multimedia applications okay. uh, that just aren't available with IPv4 today. So there's basically a whole expanded protocol. Yes, exactly. So I guess we talked, you, you mentioned before that the inefficient allocation of, of IP addresses. You're saying like, I think like MIT and a bunch of other universities have Class A addresses? Correct. Okay. And each Class A has about 16 million, 16.7 million mm-hmm. addresses. Right. And so in the beginning of the Internet, these were doled out to research labs and um, universities who were involved. Right. And, you know, so they got these large blocks of address space. And it wasn't until years later that everybody figured out, oh, wait a minute, you right. know, the Internet's going to be really valuable. We better conserve the space. So we have a situation where about half of the address space has been given out primarily right. to U.S. organizations, and countries overseas can't get space. So you have MIT with this 16.7 million block of addresses, right. way more than is available in all of China. Oh, nice. So, so MIT's got more addresses than every single... They could assign one and throw it away for every student for the next, like, 200 years, right. and it's still... Right. That's messy. Right, but it's, it, but it's a sticky situation for MIT, too, because uh-huh. it's very expensive for them to go back and readdress their entire network. It's right. not a trivial task very time-consuming, very expensive. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's a tough call for them as well in terms of being able to keep some of that address space back. Okay. That's not in, you know, in, insignificant. So for upgrading, like, existing servers and routers and, and, and all the other good stuff that's between point A and point B, is this a software upgrade, a hardware upgrade? I think in, initially it'll be a software upgrade. Um, Cisco, for example, is going to be rolling out IPv6 support in its next routers. Uh-huh. Um, but long-term, you're going to want that support in hardware to have better performance. Okay. So what end users are going to see is IPv6. IPv6 uh, initially built into their operating systems, email packages, etc., and then over time you'll see it in the backbone of the Internet built into the switching equipment and routers. Got it. So um, it sounds like it's going to be an expensive transition for a lot of people. Yes, particularly for ISP. They're the ones with the large investment in equipment, um, and they're the ones who are really dragging their feet in terms of adopting IPv6. Hopefully for end users it'll just be built into their Windows 2000 or you know whatever operating system they're using. Right. So will this offer above and beyond, obviously, the additional addressing space and additional security, any performance advantages, or is that actually? It sounds like it almost might be a performance hit until they have the hardware to deal with. Right, but uh, long term, it should help a lot with security because it'll be okay. end-to-end security. Right now, where you have situations where people use network address translation, what they do is have you know one public internet address mapped to lots of private internet right. addressing, and that device, that network address translation, can botch up your security systems. It can botch up the multimedia applications right. because it's you know a middleman, and IPv6 gets rid of all of that. So can we end up with a situation where maybe, you know, I want to run Quake inside my house and outside my house, and it's, it's great, I'm using Quake as an example for this one. <laughs> but, There's actually one of the Internet games, I think it is Quake, that's already IPv6 oh. available, that uh, hobbyists can go out and play with it. That's awesome. That's so awesome. Cool. Any other final 
general thoughts about what's going on with IPv6? Or? No, I think the real thing that the U.S. needs to think about is, you know, in our country, there isn't a real shortage. Uh -huh. So, you know, it's easy for us to be complacent about not moving to IPv6 because most of us can get the Internet address space that we need. Already. But, you know, there's a real crisis in Japan and in Europe, uh -huh. um, particularly with new applications on mobile devices. Uh -huh. And I think that's where you're going to see IPv6 adoption getting pushed first. Wow. So a quick question in terms of the political side of this. You know, how interoperable are IPv4 and IPv6? Can you implement it in Japan and in Europe and, and have us dragging our feet here in the States? Well, what the Internet Engineering Community, the Internet Engineering Task Force in, in particular, which created the IPv6 standard, what they're trying to do is create a way for easy transition. And the two protocols have really run together for a long period of time during mm -hmm. this transition period. It's not like they switch one off and switch to the other right away. Right. So that kind of migration tools will make the whole transition much easier on everybody. Sounds like everybody was thinking when they put this together. That's right. All right, good stuff. Thanks, Carolyn. Carolyn, or actually I should say folks, that was Carolyn Marsan, Senior Editor of Network World. We want to thank you for again for joining us. Folks, if you're looking for the latest news in computer networking, pick up a copy of Network World, or better yet, visit their website at www.nwfusion.com. And to find out more about IPv6, you can check out an article Carolyn wrote for us at thescreensavers.com. Now, folks, stay where you are. Still come on this very show. We're going to upgrade an iMac to the power of the G4. We've got a ton of wild calls in our uh, Olympic computer support information lifestyle thing. And, of course, Sylvia is going to come on to show us the new personal digital assistant for kids. Really, folks, it's not an iMac this time. Really, she does on today's press here. All that and more as the screen favors rolls on.
screensavers. I am Leo Laporte. And I'm Patrick Gordon. Thank you all for joining us this fine young evening. Our question of the day, because of course our Geek Library selection today was the triumph of the nerds, we're asking you, can the nerds declare victory? Finally! It's ours! We own it! Say it loud. I'm geek and proud! I'm out of the closet. Admit you're a geek. <laughs> okay. I've always admitted I'm a geek. I mean, I've always admitted I'm a geek. I'm sure. proud to be a geek. But uh, and I'm, I'm absolutely serious. I, I think that, uh, first of all, it's obvious the answer to the question. And we have one. But I think that it's something to be celebrated, not because, you know, it's those of us who suffered through high school with bad cases of acne and working on the AV squad and couldn't get a date or nothing. Oh, come on, folks. But it's also... A way of rewarding brains. Really, that's what it comes down to. We're nerds because we like to use our noggins. Yeah, but, you know, is, 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 it, you know, is it the joy of creation that we're applauding here or the fact that some people finally got rich typing up codes? That, too. Uh-huh. Nothing uh -huh. wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that, Patsy. Uh -huh. Get to the website and give us your vote. Did the nerd triumph or is victory just out of our grasp? Oh, boy. In the meantime, while recently Leo keeps grasping for the little green light on the other side of Long Island Sound, Vinny joins us on the Tech TV Netcam Network from Gaia, California. What's up, Vinny? Hi, Leo. Hi, Patrick. Hey, Vinny. Here's your... Oh, look at that. It's Mrs. Vinny. <laughs> Hi, Hi Nina. Is that, is that your wife, girlfriend? That's my daughter. Your daughter? Yeah. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> you're Vinny, you look so young. Oh, well, we just well, lost you. a fan. Well, thank you, Leo. You were young when you had her, weren't you? Uh, yes, I was. Yeah, you were. Because how old is she now? She is 15. Well, she also looks older than her age. Yeah. What a nice, nice looking family. Well, then. thank you. Yes. What can we do for you, Nina and Vinny? Well, last night I installed a second hard drive into my system. Yes. Uh, copied everything over to it, set yes. it as master. Yes. Kept my old hard drive as a slave. When I rebooted, the drive letters have changed. So now my CD ROM, which was D, is now E. Yeah. And when I go to run any games from Shortcut, oh, it yeah. cannot find it. And I've tried to go with the device manager, properties in the hard drive, but the letters are grayed out, and I can't change the letters on the hard drive. We, we got some good news, we got some bad news for you, Vinny. Okay. The good news is that this happens every time you add an additional hard drive. All right. Yeah. Uh, actually, no, it's the bad news, I guess. All right, well, yeah. hold on. Basically, this is normal. It's right? fixable is the good news. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good. What happens, you load a hard drive, right? Windows basically goes, it, it's got the A and the B drive, mm -hmm. which it reserves for, you know, your floppy drive you boot from, and a floppy drive that none of us still own, because none of us, do you have two floppy drives anymore? No, but yeah. sometimes your zip drive will look like a floppy on some right. systems. So. But uh, for the most part, basically, your A drive is for your floppy, your B drive is off in the ether or another floppy or a zip drive, your C drive is your boot drive, and then it basically starts assigning out hard drive letters to create them anything else it can, and then it, after that, those the hard drive letters, it installs the, the removable drive letters, and then it starts doing drive letters for stuff over the internet or the ethernet. Uh -huh. and, the, and the rules are basically, yeah. uh, we've, I've spent some time cogitating about this, and I've finally come to the conclusion that the rules are, it says all of the primary partitions in order uh, going through the IDE channels. Then it comes back and does all the extended partitions, the logical partitions. Mm -hmm. So adding a drive will do this, but also even partitioning will do this. And that's, yeah. by the way, where the answer comes. You don't by any chance have a program called Partition Magic, do you? No, I don't have drive copy. Drive copy may or may not do this. But, uh, you'll have to look. Partition Magic, because this happens yeah. anytime you add a partition, has mm -hmm. a little program called Drive Mapper. Okay. And it's a very simple program. You could do it by hand. It's just nice to have it automated. What it does is you say, I moved my, I added a thing, and I moved my C drive, now my D drive. And what it actually does is it goes through some basic files and changes C to D all where it's necessary. Oh. Here's where it changes it, and you could do this by hand. It goes into all the .ini files. Mm -hmm. Those are pretty easy. You could even use the uh, this file search to go through the text files mm -hmm. and look for that and make that switch. <clears throat> and this is a little bit harder. It goes into the registry, oh. and it looks for all references. You say, oh, but registry does have a find. It doesn't have a find and replace, regedit. It does have a find feature. So you'd look for all examples of C, and you change it to C. And look, look, be smart about it. Don't look for just C because you'll find a lot of those. Look right. for C colon backslash okay. and change that to D or whatever it is, D colon backslash. Right. And that's what Drive Mapper does. It's almost, to be honest with you, worth buying Partition Magic just, just to do that. that. It's, it's, it's a long, awkward process. Even before you get to the registry editing stuff, it's a long, awkward pain to go through, especially if you have a whole bunch of stuff that's looking for your CD-ROM drive uh -huh. um, to do that. Now, so it's basically, it's systems, when they're installed, when programs are installed, they put it in their settings files where stuff is found. 
Windows put it in its settings file. It happens to be the registry where stuff is found. You've just got to find all the, all the uh, instances of that and change it. Okay. Okay? Yeah. All right. I'll give it a shot. You can get Nina to do that. Oh, yeah. Nina can do it. She'll yeah. do it tonight. Hey, here's, here's hey here's her Nicola, a Nicola drive letter. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. You know, and if you're feeling really paranoid about this, when you rebuild the system, you can actually assign a drive letter, something like LRM or Q, something ridiculous like that, to your CD-ROM drive. Oh, okay. You can do that because in your removable drives, you can actually reserve a drive letter for each of those drives. You can even change them after the fact. Yeah. You just okay. can't change fixed disk drives. Hey, we're gonna we're gonna uh, put you to work. But you know what? I had a thought. I think Nina should help you on this. Can we get you and Nina to do the? Uh, Me and the, Nina. Sure. Yeah, together again. Finally, we, father we daughter time. All right, take us to break, will you? Okay. Thanks, Patrick and Leo. Jimmy Doc has a new handheld organizer for the younger set. When the screensavers continue. Now what's Nina gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> Good job, guys. ScreenSavers.com is the best place for more information about what's on this show. Computers really have revolutionized the way we do business. But do you know how much your business has joined the 21st century? Take this week's Super Geek Challenge. Test yourself and your business. It's all about business computing at ScreenSavers.com. Our congratulations to uh, Gibson from Davenport, Iowa, the winner of yesterday's Super Geek Quiz t-shirt or cap giveaway. Tux is just sitting there doing absolutely nothing of interest. Oh, I get it. He's a nerd. That's why he's so boring. But he's rich. Be sure to fill out the form after you've taken the quiz for your chance to win. It was so subtle, John Ross. It just completely fooled me. I didn't. I had no idea. It was very subtle. We teased you in yesterday, and but now it is actually is time to find out. Do you know how much of a cucumber is actually water? Sumi Doc. He's the kid tester who got the lowdown on the new PDA for kids on today's. It'll all make sense, I promise. Fresh gear. Personal digital assistants like the Pum and Handspring Visor have become indispensable tools for most of us. Everyone from supermodels to CEOs are discovering that PDAs are ideal for stashing important information. Now manufacturers are looking at children as an untapped PDA market. 
The Fusion by VTech is a handheld organizer for kids with a couple of features that may make the PDA packing grown-ups a little envious. The Fusion features all the standard PDA apps like an organizer and an address book, but adds something extra, a digital camera, which definitely scores points with the little ones. A favorite thing about the Fusion was the digital camera, because it's like taking photos of people. Steven, our kid tester, was also impressed with the camera's features. Um, there's this photo gallery that you can look at your pictures, and then there's a place, a photo maker, that you can do special effects on. The integrated digital camera definitely makes the $120 Fusion unique. It can capture up to 25 black and white images on its one meg of internal flash memory. The camera also has the ability to rotate 180 degrees, allowing greater freedom, while the Fusion's LCD acts as a viewfinder. An included docking station connects to the stereo port, allowing captured images to be transferred to a PC. The Fusion includes a stylus to use with a keypad. Along the bottom are the menu control buttons and a directional pet for menu navigation. The Fusion offers students some nice built-in applications, such as a spell checker, a language translator, and plenty of activities. But the Fusion isn't all fun and games. Steven actually learned something. I learned that 96% of uh, cucumbers water. It may be an issue. We're not entirely convinced that a $120 electronic device is the best thing for a young child to be carrying around at school. But the Fusion's feature list could make it a useful tool for a student. Overall, we give the VTech Fusion three out of five stars. It's $119 and is available now. Wow. 96% water. Who would have thought it? All those seeds, all that green and... Still 96% water. You can catch a new fresh year every weekend afternoon at 12.30 Eastern right here on Tech TV. Here's an email from, I don't know. He asks, have you guys heard about IMAX Power G4, the new processor upgrade for the IMAX? What do you think? Well, they sure will tell you. When the screensavers, we'll not even do it when the screensavers continue. Gentlemen, we broke the Mac just to show you. We you ripped, broke it! We've ripped the heart and soul of it. It's an iMac. Now, this is the original iMac, the Rev-A. Yes, this is the original Rev-A. That's why there's a fan. That's why there's not all this cool open space with a clear color. But this will work with anyone? We should point out, the Slinky is not part of this. It will not work with the with the DV iMacs, which is really funny. The ones, the video editing iMacs, the ones you're desperately wanting, why are we showing a picture of the case? Because it's uh, beautiful. Well, you think that's lovely? Yeah, this is actually, well, as you can see, the, it will not work. This G4 upgrade, oddly enough, and 
we're not quite sure why, will not work with, with the DVI Max. And maybe, However, you know, form factor may be different or something like that. <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris. I'd like to officially apologize to our director for teasing her on air. Um, <laughs> but we actually have it here. We pulled the guts out of it. It's a pretty simple switch. Um, once you actually pull this out and flip it over, this is, this is where the processor would go? This is where the processor module is, actually inside all of these older iMacs. This is basically your heat sink. That tiny little part is your processor there. That's the G3. Yes, that's the G3. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is a little nerve-wracking. We have to pop that out. Ooh. Oh, so there's a whole little... Uh, exactly. There's a whole little module. And that actually has the SO DIMMs you use for your memory. So the memory's on that, too. All right. Exactly. All right. Now we're going to open the memory to save it because we're going to put it in the new one. Yeah. Got it. In his or pocket. And meanwhile, electrical engineers all over the nation are going, He was not grounded! <laughs> And Leo, have we ever been grounded on the show? We haven't. And I'm going to explain to you why yeah. not. Uh, if you're doing this anywhere where static electricity is a problem, you absolutely should ground yourself yeah. and handle static. We live in a humid clime where there isn't really any static electricity to speak of, and we have yet to have any problems zapping stuff. Can we knock on wood now that we've mentioned static yeah, electricity? Well, or touch the metal. <laughs> that might be more effective. But you probably should if you're doing this anywhere where, you know, if you've ever had a static shock, get one of the wristbands that you attach to a ground water pipe or, uh, or mm -hmm. any static matter, something like Make that. Make sure that properly. So that's pretty simple, though. It just popped right in. Yeah. Just don't carry these things around in your pocket. Oh, come on. You know you love doing it. <laughs> Not that much different. And then so now that's the heat sink you just put on there, yeah? And that's, okay, clips go home. So while I was talking, Patrick's actually done the, uh, the upgrade. The upgrade. What's amazing, though, is, is uh, here's the thing. Is, is like we always say, you're only upgrading, in this case, the processor. You're not making the memory faster. You're not making the hard drive faster. Worst of all, you're not making the graphics faster. Although it would be a good idea while you got it open, maybe to add another 128 or uh, 256 yes. uh, megs of RAM. Yeah, because, you know, the, the system is definitely hungry for more RAM. Yeah. We're going to flip this thing over. It's like a sandwich, folks. So this is, this is basically the whole computer, and this the rest of it is the monitor. Wait, what about these wires? Do they have uh, any important... Pull them out to the side. We're going to plug those in in a second. Uh, 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 pull them out to the side where? Uh, up the top. Okay, hold that like that. Okay. Really? It'll go in? Well, if it doesn't, we probably killed yet another innocent product on there. We got that over there. Oh, look at that. Look at that. What Isn't that amazing? Man, you are so good. Um, it's all Roger. What do these do? Well, these actually plug they in here. They don't look like Roger. <laughs> So this is actually a yeah. fairly easy upgrade. Now, what are we going to get? Well, we've got a G3 running at, what, two, was it 350? Uh, yeah, it's a 350. 350. Uh, and we're upgrading it to 233, I'm sorry, a 250 original one. Oh, wow. wow. And we're upgrading this. that long? Yeah. <laughs> That's day one of the iMac. We're upgrading this to how fast of a G4? Uh, I want to say it's a 400 megahertz processor. 433, they're telling me. Well, it's okay. good that we we're, we're together <laughs> on all these numbers today, ladies and gentlemen. So that's a, that's a big improvement, not only because of this clock speed, but because we're going right. from a G3 to G4. What is the chief difference between a G3 and a G4? Well, the pretty difference is, is the speed and the architecture and some of the additional controls that are inside of there. The uh, Apple tests the Velocity Engine, which is the yeah. Altavec technology. It's basically the same thing as the SSE technology that it comes in Pentium 3 processors really improves certain kinds of mathematics that tend to be used in 3D graphics, voice recognition, things like that. Yeah. Uh, I've talked to people who talk about the, comp the compare the uh, relative merits of SSE on Intel and Altavec on uh, Motorola, and they say the Altavec implementation is a lot better. Yeah. You will notice that if you use Photoshop, the Photoshop plugins will run a lot faster, more than just clock speed would indicate. Uh, wow, it booted. It even Look at booted. That. The nice thing, uh, we actually ran uh, some of the Mac bench tests. We also did, just to do a real pure thing that you can definitely relate to, we, we encoded a bunch of MP3. Actually, Roger took the time to encode it. It took about eight minutes to, to download, actually, to rip and encode this album with the G3 processor. With the G4 400, it took three minutes. More than twice as fast. Yes, that's, that's a 62% performance improvement. So if you're dealing with any kind of artistic or video editing, audio editing, anything, it's basically a heavy load on your processor. This is probably worthwhile. It's not a cheap upgrade. How much? Probably going to be about five hundred and fifty to six hundred dollars. And this only cost a thousand or twelve hundred yeah. when we bought it. And you're going to have to send in your old module. That module you're holding up, where they go? want it back. I believe they actually want that back to get the full rebate on that. Okay. Of course, you know what? You can't do anything with it. It's not like you're going to build another system around that. Makes some so, nice jewelry. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, big necklace. <laughs> it would go well with the race cars. <laughs> you can 
even see them with a race car. Look at that. It's booting up. It's booting faster. It's running faster. Yeah. This is, I have to say, a pretty easy upgrade. Yeah. It's a pricey upgrade. So you might want to think, is it yeah. maybe worth getting a, a, a faster Mac instead of upgrading your old uh, that's, iMac? That's, that's one of the big questions, I think. Yeah. Given how cheap the new Macs are, um, you're not going to get the graphics improvement. Anything past the first or second series of Macs, you have the, you have no alt here. You, know, right. you don't have the tier, so you can't actually upgrade them. Right. If you do do processor-intensive stuff and you're not worried about your hard drive or any of the other peripherals, this isn't a bad deal. It's an expensive deal. Put some new life into your iMac. And, and he did it. it. Look at it. It's booted. It's running and everything. I'm so impressed. This is fun. Coming up next. Wow. Well, here what you have to say. Your taxes, your emails, and the screen savers continues. <laughs> oh. Don't change that channel. Patrick and Leo will be back when the Twin Towers return on Tech TV.